a very interesting study for me in my own spiritual growth. I'm growing just like you are. Um, I'm gro- trying to grow closer to the heart of Jesus. I am uh, by no means perfect in every single class and sermon, and, and every time I get to speak, I get to study uh, more about God's Word and dive deep um, into his, uh, into the glory of uh, of his word, and it just it changes me more uh, and more every day. And I'm just I'm thankful for that. I'm so thankful uh, for the word of God and, and what it does to my heart. And and hopefully uh, you you are um, in the word daily and are being transformed by it as well. Uh, last week we began talking about just some general discussion points concerning providence. Uh, we're going to finish that up here tonight. Um, just look at some basic uh, points about providence that, that are beneficial to know um, and helpful as we live the Christian life. Um, and then we're going to get into something a little bit more specific. Uh, last week, we started talking about how providence is not dependent upon our recognition of it. Um, in fact, God's providential care is with His children, whether they recognize it or not. Uh, we looked at the example in Colossians chapter 1, uh, the mystery that was revealed uh, to the saints. Uh, it, it was probably beyond uh, the minds of the Old Testament writers, uh, the, the full measure of, of what God had in mind, of what God had in store uh, for humanity, how He would send His Son, Jesus, fully God, fully human, into the world um, to die for the world, to be resurrected for the world, and to redeem the world, and to give the world hope that they, if, they, if they too repented, if they repented and, and submitted to the Lord Jesus, that they may also on the last day be raised in like manner, in the same manner as He was. Um, I I don't think it was in the minds um, fully of the Old Testament writers when they prophesied about these things. Um, When they wrote about these things, they uh, they didn't know uh, God's work in the world. They didn't know that God was doing something grand and something magnificent in the moment. So providence, God's work in the world, His provision for His children and His creatures, it's not dependent upon our recognition of it. But we certainly know that He is working in the world. And and that's, like we talked about last week, that, to me, that is so exciting. It is so exciting to uh, ponder the fact that God is doing something right now. Something grand, something magnificent, something that is beyond my comprehension. Something good in the world He is attempting to accomplish um, and, and it's not in His working, providing for us, it's not dependent on that we know that, what He's doing specifically. Uh, we just have to trust and have faith. Okay, um, let's see. Let's, okay, so here's another, um, just a general point uh, that is very helpful uh, when we think about God's providence um, and, and, uh, and grow in it, is that our response to providence, our response to God's provision and His work in the world is perhaps. Perhaps providence is perhaps. That should be our response to God's work in the world. Perhaps God is doing this. Perhaps He is working in this way when I ponder specific events within my life, within the world, or within the church. Like it says on the screen, since we do not know God's specific activity in the world and in our lives in the moment, a proper response to our circumstances is perhaps. And we see this principle in Philemon chapter 1. There's only one chapter, uh, but specifically verse 15. I want to look at uh, the book of Philemon. Uh, I want to read verses 10 through 16. So take out your Bible with me there. We see this perhaps principle, firstly from the Apostle Paul and, uh, and also in, in, um, in many other areas in the Bible. But uh, this is what's commonly uh, referenced when we think about this perhaps principle, uh, Paul's example of it in the book of Philemon. So look with me in Philemon chapter 1, starting in verse 10 through 16. Paul says, I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. 
Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. And literally, Onesimus in Greek, it means, uh, it means useful. Um, so there's a play on words there. In verse 12 it says, I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this, perhaps, is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me. But how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord." Uh, so, I'm not going to get into the uh, details of the book of Philemon. I just want to look at this perhaps principle here. Uh, Paul didn't know for certain, he did not know what God was doing through this situation with Philemon and, and Onesimus. Onesimus is, is this runaway slave, and, and he, uh, somehow he meets Paul um, while, while he's in during his imprisonment. Um, and Paul sends Onesimus back to Philemon with this letter. Uh, Paul didn't know for certain, he says, what God was doing through this whole situation. What Paul says is that possibly, he's saying that possibly God orchestrated this situation so that Onesimus and Philemon might no longer have this slave and master relationship, but have a brother and brother in Christ relationship. Paul says maybe, possibly, perhaps that's why this whole situation is being played out. Uh, perhaps I ran into Onesimus. Perhaps God, God's hand is in this. God is orchestrating in this. So Philemon, your relationship with Onesimus may be restored and you instead, instead of calling him a slave, you may call him a brother in Jesus Christ. So Paul's response to God's providence, Paul's response to God's work in the world is perhaps. Perhaps God is doing this. We don't know for certain. We don't know with absolute certainty that God is, is orchestrating this event, causing these things to happen. Maybe He is, maybe He isn't. Perhaps He is. Um, that's our, um, that should be our response to God's providence. Perhaps God is doing this in my life. Perhaps God is hindering me from doing this certain thing in my life. Perhaps um, God is working. Now I want to look at this point along the lines of this perhaps principle. And I think this is very important. It's not legitimate, I, do, I don't believe, to say that all good or all bad things are caused by God. It's not legitimate to say that all good, all good things, all seemingly good things, and all bad, negative, seemingly negative things are caused by God. Many people na naively say, well, all good things, all good things are from God, and all bad things are from the devil. However, we read this principle within Scripture. We know that this is very true. God causes seemingly bad, seemingly bad, and good things for His children's good. We see a principle, we see an example of this in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8 through 10, I believe. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 through 10, where God causes something that is seemingly negative, is seemingly bad, uh, with certain motivations for um, faith building. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 through 10, it says, For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction, this is the Apostle Paul, he experienced affliction in Asia, of the affliction we experienced in Asia, for we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and He will deliver us. On Him we have set our hope 
that he will deliver us again. Now, I believe that the way this text reads, if you look closely at verse uh, 9, the way this text reads indicates to us that there is, in fact, an intelligent design behind Paul's affliction. Look at the wording. It says, but that, the affliction, but that, but the affliction was to make us that kind of implies, that says to me that there's some intelligence behind this affliction, behind this affliction being caused. Um, I believe that this text implies that it was God, that it was God who caused their affliction. Uh, and, and you see the outcome of that affliction. It wasn't something negative, it was something positive. Uh, in the latter part of verse 9, it says, but that... The affliction was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. So, it's not legitimate to say that all bad, seemingly bad things, um, or, or all, or yeah, or all, all seemingly bad things are, are not, ca- God doesn't cause anything bad. Um, God doesn't cause anything seemingly bad uh, because we see multiple examples in Scripture where um, God causes seemingly negative things. God orchestrates seemingly bad um, and negative things for a good purpose. In Job chapter 42, verse 11, here's another example of this. It says, Then came to him all his brothers and sisters and all who had known him before and ate bread with him in his house. And they showed him sympathy and comforted him for all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. And each of them gave him a piece of money and a ring of gold. If you look in the Hebrew language, the Hebrew word brought here in the text is in the hifel uh, verb form. Um, that means it, 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 it indicates causality. Um, if a verb is in the hifel, <coughs> that means that um, that uh, that the that, that it's that that um, that God is causing this to happen. Uh, that the um, that the that the object here is causing whatever the um, whatever the action is. It it's indicates causality. So this text here, um, the the way that the text reads, it says that God was the cause. The text literally says of Job's pain. That's what the text literally says. Now, now, now an example of this, um, God could be um, the cause of one's bankruptcy. Uh, we wouldn't think about it like that in the moment. Uh, but I think it's very legitimate to say that God could be the cause of one's financial downfall, of one's, ba- of one's bankruptcy, to help her trust in Him more than being deeply rooted in material wealth. I think it's very legitimate to say um, God may perhaps cause seemingly negative things to accomplish a good purpose, to accomplish a good goal. And, and along the same lines, I'm not saying that God causes all tragedies. I'm not saying that God orchestrates hurricanes and natural disasters and all kinds of um, evil, uh, but rather He may perhaps be the cause of seemingly negative circumstances for our good. Um, and, and that's the main point, is that when negative things happen and God is the cause of them, um, there's always a, a, a righteous, good purpose behind it. And we're going to talk more about this when we talk about providence and discipline. Uh, we're going to talk about how um, the Bible teaches that God disciplines His, his people. Um, So, like I said, God causes seemingly bad and good things for His children, not just all seemingly good things. That falls into this category of the perhaps principle. Perhaps God um, is working in this. Perhaps God is causing this. Um, Now, at the same time, uh, talked about God being a cause of seemingly bad and, and good things. At the same time, Satan causes, we see examples of this in Scripture, Satan causes bad and seemingly good things for our harm at the same time. In um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 18, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 18, 
It says, Because we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. Now, just as God works in the world, Satan also works in the world with different motives. God's work in the world is to cause faith, is to draw people to Him, is to uh, create a family of, of, of redeemed so that all people uh, may know the joy that is found in Him. Satan has different motives. Satan works in the world. Um, Satan, uh, this world is influenced by Satan, but his work in the world is uh, with different motives um, than, than God has. Satan works for our harm, contrary um, to God's work in the world. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, it says, In their case, the God of this world, being Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Now, like what we talked about before, our God is ultimately in control of everything. But Satan's influence in this world is so pervasive, uh, it's as if he rules it. Uh, Satan works to further this text, the specific context of this verse is this verse is that Satan works in the world to further blind those who do not obey the gospel, who refuse the gospel, who reject the gospel. One of Satan's primary objectives and his primary goals is to put a veil over the minds of those who are already lost so that they don't come to faith in him. That is one of Satan's major tasks within the world today. Our task, you know, we're the light of the world. We're the salt of the earth. We preach the message of salvation, of saving grace. We're attempting to take the veil off of people's eyes and their minds so that they can see and submit to the beauty and the glory and the majesty of Jesus Christ. Satan's mission in the world is the exact opposite, to further blind the believers and put a, or the unbelievers and to put a veil over their minds. But Satan's influence is not just over unbelievers. Scripture clearly teaches that Satan's influence is also uh, over believers as well. A very familiar passage. It's not here on the screen, but I'll read it. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So Satan not only works within the lives of unbelievers, the lost, to blind them so that they don't come to faith in the gospel and know the joy that Christ brings, uh, he also causes... Uh, he also works to cause unbelief in the hearts of believers. Um, he seeks to attack every single one of us tonight. Satan's, one of Satan's primary goals is to cause unbelief within our heart and to draw us away from, uh, from the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, that, um, I've, I think I've mentioned before, but we read about in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12, um, our enemy of unbelief. Unbelief is one of our uh, biggest, the, 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 uh, the most destructive enemies that we have. And Satan's goal in everything that he does is to attempt, is to cause unbelief to be rooted inside of those that do believe in Jesus Christ. And he does it through all kinds of ways, um, through doubts, through pleasures other than, other than God, uh, through tragedies, through all kinds of ways. Satan plants unbelief within our hearts. Um, so, uh, so Satan works in this world uh, to, um, to cause us to uh, reject Christ. And in 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 11, verse 14, it says, And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Uh, so Satan disguises himself uh, as, as something beautiful, as something good. You know, we think of uh, an angel of light. Um, that's something that we would automatically think of as something positive, wouldn't it? An angel of, of light as opposed to an angel of darkness. 
The Bible specifically says that Satan disguises, he distorts his true image to appear to us as something good, as something pleasing. And we can offer all kinds of examples um, of ways that Satan influences us and, and uses seemingly good things uh, in our life and may cause seemingly good things to uh, root unbelief within our hearts and draw us away from Jesus Christ. Um, an example is that Satan uh, could very possibly be the cause of uh, one getting a promotion at work in order to take away his or her focus on Christ and the family. Um, that's a very legitimate possibility I think we can uh, we see uh, from Scripture. So, what I'm trying to say, the, the, uh, the perhaps principle, um, is that our response to God's work in the world, God's provision, when we see all of these events uh, within Scripture and we try to determine, is this God's work in the world? Is God doing this for me? Did God give me this promotion? Is, is, uh, is God working through uh, what we see out in the world today? Is God's hand within what's happening in Afghanistan? Is God's hand in the coronavirus or what's happened in Haiti or, uh, or any number of the situations that we're facing in the world today? The general principle that the Bible teaches us of uh, determining providence, our response to it is perhaps. Um, God does want us to look within the world and see how He could be working, but our response is possibly, perhaps God is doing this with a sense of optimism. Perhaps God is working in this way. So providence is uh, perhaps. Uh, okay, so second to last general point um, as far as providence goes, and then we'll move on, is that providence, I believe, encourages faith. Providence encourages faith. In Genesis chapter 22, verse 8, Genesis chapter 22, verse 8, it says, It says, Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went both of them together. Abraham knew full well that God was concerned about him and his life. He came to him and told him that he would uh, bless his family, bless his heritage, cause him to be a great nation with a multitude of of descendants. So Abraham knew that God was concerned with his affairs and, and he promised to work in his life. Uh, this gave Abraham a reason uh, to have faith in God's provision, um, knowing that God was concerned about him, knowing that God uh, was intervening in his life, knowing that God was providing and, and working within his life, gave uh, Abraham the man of faith. Um, encouragement to keep pressing on, to have faith. Uh, since I know God is working in the world for His glory and man's joy. Remember, those are the two uh, goals of God's providence that should be our goals in life as well. His glory, His self-exaltation, which leads into our joy. Uh, we can only experience fullness of joy if God is exalted in our life. We looked at that, um, that seeming, seemingly contradiction um, last time. Uh, but knowing that God is working in this world um, and, and intervening in it, it, it encourages me, and I'm talking about me personally, it encourages me to, to have faith, to keep pressing on. Um, I, I know that, you know, uh, we don't hold a uh, God, you know, we, we don't hold a deistic view of the world in, in which God created the world and then stepped back and then doesn't have anything to do with it and doesn't inter intervene in human affairs whatsoever or doesn't cause things to happen or, or, or attempting to accomplish a specific purpose within, within the world. No, I believe and I know through a study of Scripture that God is 
working. He is doing something wonderful and magnificent through all of these events that we see around us, personally in our own lives and within and, 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 and events that we see um, on the news. And that encouraged me, that encourages me to keep going, to keep, uh, to, to keep having faith. Uh, to grow in my faith, knowing that God has not abandoned me. Um, he is working for um, His glory uh, in my joy. Um, that, uh, that helps me uh, to stay on the straight and narrow path and keep fighting the good fight of faith. Um, and, and that's uh, one of the uh, practical principles, I, I believe, uh, that, that providence will help us in, in our Christian life. Um, and it gives us more motivation to be the people that God wants us to be, um, knowing that God um, is, is working to um, accomplish our good. Um, okay, so a last general point, and then we'll move on. Our time is slowly dwindling. Uh, providence, lastly, is ground for thankfulness. Um, and I think this is a very important principle um, because we've already established the fact that God is working in the world. We know through study of Scripture that God is working. And our response, one, is perhaps, perhaps God is doing this, perhaps God is doing that. But we should also be immensely thankful, immensely thankful uh, for God's provision, for God's work in the world. Um, and that should, I believe, be a, a part of our prayer life. God, thank you. Thank you for intervening in my life. Thank you for working within uh, the world and, and everything that we see around us. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 15, Paul says, Thanks be to God for His inexpressible gift. So here Paul's response to God's providential grace is overflowing thankfulness. We looked, I can't remember if it was last time or the time before, uh, that uh, God's goal in the entire scheme of redemption, um, God's goal in the entire plan of salvation, giving us a way to be reconciled, having our relationship repaired and, and restored and us recreated um, into the image of, of Jesus Christ, um, all of that uh, is... Um, by God's providence, um, all of that is for God's glory um, and its reason to give, to fall on my hands and knees and to give God continual thanks. God, thank you. Thank you for providentially uh, working in this world uh, for, uh, for, for um, causing events to happen, for orchestrating things, of, uh, to make it possible for your son to come into this world, to die on a cross, and to be raised on the third day so that I might be saved. God, thank you for your providential grace. Uh, that should be, I believe, a consistent part of, of who we are um, and, and a consistent part of our, uh, of our prayer life is um, is to give continual thanks to God, thanksgiving and gratitude for His work in the world, for His provision, and for everything that He has done and is currently doing for us. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12 says, I thank Him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because He judged me faithful, appointing me to His service. Uh, so we see here that God gives enormous providential strength God gives providential strength to the one that trusts in Him. And an appropriate response to this strength is gratitude, is thankfulness. Um, and that's another encouraging point, is that when I trust in Him, when my heart is consumed in belief in Him, and even in trials and tribulations and times when uh, I, I have no reason to have faith, but I choose to believe that He is um, taking care of me and, and, and guiding me, um, He gives me strength by His providence. He gives me strength to endure, strength to keep fighting, strength to uh, grow, strength to be the person that Jesus wants me to be. Um, and thank God for uh, that providential strength that, that He gives to us. And lastly, in Romans chapter 6, verse 17, um, it says, But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. 
Uh, so here, Paul identifies God as the one that helped the non-believers come to faith in him through providence. And again, thank God for the faith you have in him, making it possible to believe, making it possible to thrive in a relationship uh, with him. So we're going to stop right there. I don't want to jump in uh, to, because we only have about another minute left. Um, but uh, let's stop right there. Next, uh, not next week, uh, Anna and I are going on vacation uh, next week, so we won't be with you all. Um, but uh, the next week, we will be talking about providence and more specifically, um, God's provision for daily necessities. Thank you for your attention, and, and we'll uh, pick up in two weeks.